Okay, so I am honored to be on this stage with so much talent and also a little nervous that I'm about to speak to a, 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 a room full of artists and educators who have been sitting for about 60 plus minutes. So if I could have you, we'll do this like the classroom, quietly without talking to your per, the person next to you, raise up, raise, stand up, give a little, you know, Shake, shake your butt a little bit. And I want you to think back about 10 years, 10 or 15 years, and I want you to think about how much change happened between 2000, 1995, 2000, and today, okay? Think about how much change you have seen in the world over the past 10 to 15 years, okay? And then I want you to put your hands up, okay, if you think that the amount of change that we're likely to see in the next 10 years will be even greater. Okay, so I want hands up, and I don't want hands, I want some jazz hands, I want, if you're a musician, I want some long, wide bows, everyone else can do some Beyonce or something. But everyone in this room looks as though, thinks that they see a lot of change continuing in the future, okay? So, uh, you may be seated and finish in Downward Dog or something that's comfortable. Okay. So professional futurists, and I don't, I don't have my phone on stage, this is my clicker here. Professional futurists help organizations and individuals learn how to expand their foresight capacity. Okay? So we help people learn how to anticipate and lead change. And that involves two things. First, understanding the forces that are pushing us forward, and then also the forces of resistance that might keep us where we are today. Okay, so the, the best way to move beyond barriers, beyond cultures of resistance, is to understand vision and to create a shared vision of the future that engages and inspires people to actually live the change. Okay, so what I'd like to do to, uh, with you today is to provide a framework for understanding complexity and uncertainty associated with the future, and then introduce a vision of arts experiences that is more suited to uh, what many people feel is the future of learning. So when we think about the future, first we need to look at two types of change. The first type of change deals with incremental changes, often referred to as trends. Trends are slow, gradual changes that occur over time. We can measure them, we can extrapolate them forward in the form of forecast to paint a picture of the most likely future, okay? Trends are the baseline future, the future we most expect. The second type of change is known as disruptive change. It brings some sort of discontinuity to our world. It transforms how we live and see the world around us. This is the type of change that occurs when a caterpillar transforms into a butterfly. And the caterpillar has no idea that it's about to become the butterfly. So these are the two types of change, incremental and disruptive change, that push us forward. Okay? So th those are the two types of change, but what does change look like in terms of its shape? Okay. As uh, Michael uh, led us off in the beginning, there are two types of, of shapes of change. One is with inside the box. This is when we innovate. This is when we bring value within a world that preserves all of our assumptions of how things are. This is incremental innovation. And then there's this concept that futurists promote known as innovation across eras. Okay? When we change our assumptions about how it works and we innovate to anticipate the new era. So what I want to look at real quickly is, what is the shape of this era? What are the characteristics? There are three stages to era-based change. The first is a period of slow change. And it's during this period where we might detect the changes in the world, uh, but it doesn't really have a lot of personal relevance to us, and we tend to underestimate how much change is likely to happen in the long run. So imagine PCs in the 1980s. There was a, a guy or two in the, in the office that had a computer, but no need to have a computer at home. Then we enter a period of rapid change. This is when the change begins to overwhelm us and consume us, and everyone's talking about how change is accelerating. And it's during this period that we overestimate how much change is, change is like to happen in the future. Then we hit the third phase, which is a plateau. This is when we become comfortable, okay? So we pass through the PCs in the 1980s, the dot-com in the 1990s, and now we're at a point where most people that we know in the world have PCs, no big deal. And then there's a disruption, and the disruption for for this scenario is the mobile phone, the smartphone, okay? So this is the notion of era-based change, okay? What does it look like in reality? The best way to imagine era-based change is to actually think outside of arts education. Think about transportation. We did not go from walking on the ground to walking on the moon by learning how to do it faster. 
The history of bringing value creation to the world of mobility and transportation is based off of a series of very distinct eras that completely transformed the world and then faded into just being commonplace. So one of the things we notice is that eras do not disappear. They do not disappear. They often continue in their plateau, but they cease to be the, dr the primary drivers of change. Value creation is in the new era, not in the past. Okay? The role of the future is to help people anticipate what's next. So then let's imagine the artists. Let's look at the different eras that musicians have passed through. In the beginning and for most of human history, music was about face-to-face. -face. It was about song, voice, song, drum, and dance. And then we had the disruption of the printed music sheet. And this led to more complex composition of music. And when the, then, then we had the disruption of recorded music. And then the disruption of broadcast radio, broadcast television. And now we're living in an era that has been disrupted by social media. Okay? The, musician, the musician has not disappeared. The musician has not faded away. The musician has simply adapted at each era. Okay? So, within the world of education, we're passing through a similar era. Maybe I'll get the slides to advance. There we go. So for, for most of human history, learning and education was really just about the local marketplace. We learned from our elders, it was the master apprentice model, and everything that we needed to teach ourselves was relevant to our own personal lives. Then there was the disruption of the book and the disruption of the industrial age of work. And this led to the creation of the school. The school itself is a creation in society that was built to provide us with the training needed to succeed in this new era of work, okay? More recently in the 1990s, we've been disrupted by the internet and the knowledge economy. And most people in the world of education agree that we are entering a new era that is not institutionally oriented, not teacher oriented, but learner oriented. It's not as much as the education that we learn inside of formal settings, as much as it is the education that we learn informally. It's not what we learn from our teacher as much as it is about what we learn from the people around us and our own self-directed learning. So I know that Renee is gonna look more closely at this notion of learner-based uh, education. So I just wanna set this as, the, as kind of the backdrop for how we might imagine the future of arts experiences. So the secret to success in terms of navigating these eras is not to abandon the past. Okay? We are not throwing away the model of schools, the model of institutional-based learning. But we do need to recognize that we must make that transition to the learner era. And what that forces us to, us to do is to be able to hold two mindsets and gradually over time shift towards this new era. Instead of thinking like incumbents, we need to think like startups. Rather than preserving old assumptions, we need to begin exploring new assumptions. Rather than meeting current needs, we need to anticipate and create new needs. Rather than holding back in fear and doubt, we need to prototype. We need to fail fast. We need to experiment. Because the future is unpredictable, there's a lot of uncertainty, so we can't throw our entire weight forward into a world that, that is so uncertain. Okay, so this is the transition we, we must make. So the vision I'd like to share with you is not one of arts education and learning that's based off of institutions, but one that's based around a cultural marketplace. Okay? Now the marketplace analogy is often commercially oriented. I, I really don't mean it to be that way. It's, 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 it's a marketplace in the sense that we are competing. Arts is competing for people's attentions and people's passions. And we need to think about ourselves as not institutionally bound, but bound to a broader social cultural marketplace. So the way we approach this marketplace is by understanding who we need to engage, where we're going to engage them, and how we're going to do it. The first thing that I think we need to do is expand the base of learners and move from this notion that education and learning is life stage oriented to lifelong learning. And within the United States, the two most influential cohorts that we might, uh, we might consider engaging are the aging baby boomers and the rising millennials. And when we think about this vision of the future of arts experiences, we need to be certain that it matches the life stages that they are going to be entering. 
for the baby boomers, that is the later stages of their life. Whether they're retiring, whether they're going to continue working part-time, becoming more of a volunteer within their communities, that is the life stage that this vision must reach. And the, the paradigm that I think is emerging is this notion of creative aging. So where, does arts experience, where do arts experiences fit into this notion of creative aging? Then within the millennial generation, we need to reach them not as young people, but as parents, as voters, as people with children that, are sending, uh, uh, that they're sending to school. Within, and within New York, this demographic transition is even more relevant. So for years in, in New York, there was a gap between school-aged children and the elderly populations. And as we see over the next 10 to 20 years, that gap is closing. And within 20 years, there will be parity within those two audiences. So the second step then is understanding where we are like to engage people in, in terms of arts experiences. And the trend that I think is most fitting for uh, arts experiences is the continued rise of the third place. Third place was an idea that emerged in the 1990s. It is not work, it is not home. It's a place where we go to meet with people, to take care of some, some business, to relax. It's the cafe. It's the cafe culture. And what we see is this notion of third place is expanding into public spaces. We, what we see Times Square and outside of uh, 34th Street, these, these new pedestrian-friendly environments. Most institutions, when they build new buildings, are including these third places that uh, are, are open to anyone to visit at any time. I believe that it's this third place environment that is most ripe for bringing in arts experiences to gauge the general audiences. Third step is recognizing the appropriate role of technology and understanding what technology is likely to be like in the next couple years. Today our paradigm of technology is bound by sitting in front of the computer, staring at a screen. And really where technology is going is that it's disappearing, it's fading. It's becoming linked to devices that we put in our pockets. Technology-based experiences are not us looking at a screen, but looking at other individuals face-to-face -face through video-based uh, uh, interfaces. And it's also becoming voice-oriented, where we're actually talking with software, having a conversation, learning from a software program, not by typing or clicking, but through conversation. Okay? This is the direction that technology is headed. It's headed towards uh, mediating our learning experiences uh, in a way that is much more human and much more intuitive. And I, and I realize that that might scare the heck out of some people. So the final thing is, um, is how do we reach people? And, and this is certainly more forward looking. Uh, in the past, the idea of, of reaching people through technology was based off of building a website. What do we do? We need to build a, a $10,000 website. And that role of the website is also kind of plateauing. And the way that people are likely to be engaged in the future is through mobile smartphones that we carry in our pocket. And what's going to become more and more important in the future is the uh, ability for individuals to manage their identities in the real world, to use maps and location as a tool for connecting with institutions and with other individuals. So 15 years ago, we were all frightened to get online. And, and remember, there was the dog surfing the internet. Nobody knows I'm a dog on the internet, right? That was the, that was the, the, the cartoon for the, for the first part of the web. Now, my parents are on Facebook, okay? So we have become very comfortable managing our identities online. And the next phase, the next wave of adoption will be having enough, will be based on having enough trust and transparency that we manage things online, uh, in the physical world. So the question then is, how can we look at New York City as a landscape where arts experiences, arts institutions are constantly sending out beacons for individuals? Come here because there's an event about to happen. I am doing this program right now, right here. You are a block away. Come towards me. How do we build that type of social trust and transparency with anyone that is interested in experiencing arts? So this notion of location-based engagement is an opportunity for uh, art educators. So these are just some elements of this new vision of a cultural marketplace, a way for us to move beyond just having arts experiences that are dominated by 
institutional experiences and begin to test new assumptions of, of art experiences that are much more integrated into the real world. So thank you very much for your time and uh, I'll turn it back over to Phil.